Hi, welcome to the show. This is Getting High on Anthropology. My name is Marty Otanez. Tonight we have a guest, Jody Duke, with CORE, a Denver-based nonprofit. Welcome to the show, Jody. Thank you for having me. So why don't you tell us um, a little bit about yourself and what CORE is? So a little bit about me. Uh, like you said, I'm the executive director of CORE Network. It's a little nonprofit that is based in uh, Aurora, Colorado. And we are dedicated to bringing evidence-based cannabis information to the community, be that um, the researchers and clinicians or uh, people in, in the local neighborhood. Uh, and how did I get here is kind of a common question that I get. Uh, so I'll just address that up front. I started uh, in public health. So that's really my background is, is I have a master's in public health and I've always loved education, especially um, community outreach um, education. And I was working on the a health impact assessment, which is a project that helps try to find solutions to policies to make them the, the most health conscious policies available. And we recommended child resistant packaging for cannabis. So that's really where I started. And that was um, about three or four years now ago. Um, and so that's where I launched my career into, into this cannabis education. And I saw this need in the community that there's so much misinformation out there. And I called up a friend who is in policy and I said, hey, let's do this. Let's see if we can fill this need. And in full transparency, let me uh, share with people that Jody and I are colleagues. We're both board mm -hmm. members of CORE. So I've been working with Jody uh, in the organization for over a year now. And Jody, recently CORE uh, put on an event. So tell us what was the event and what was one or two of the highlights for you? So the, the major CORE event that we had this year, we have one every year. It's the annual CORE conference. Uh, this year it was at the Anschutz Medical Campus in Aurora, Colorado on November 11th. It was an all day affair. Um, we really try to bring a high quality but low cost education. So um, we did it on the shoestring, but it seemed to work out great. Uh, we had people from a variety of backgrounds come and listen to um, some wonderful speakers. We had Dr. Sievers, who is a former CU Regent um, he opened the conference uh, in the morning with a speech about uh, his background and his research in cannabis. And then uh, we had uh, a, such a variety of people. So we had Dr. Cloudwitter from IC42 Labs, who talked about the biochemistry and the potential metabolism. Um, Dr. Laura Borgelt, who talked about, um, talk, well, not just Dr. Borgelt, but Dr. Laura Borgelt and Tori Metz, who talked about child maternal health and cannabis. Overall, it was just a wonderful day, a wonderful experience, and I'm so lucky that I get to meet all of these wonderful people. Well, I was lucky as one of the organizers to work with Jody and be at the event, and uh, I got to also present, so I really appreciated that opportunity. So, Jody, share with people what kinds of people uh, go to these events and what are they like what's the messages or take-home messages they, they leave with well that's an interesting question every year we have audiences that are a little bit different we started out the first year we had um, a variety of people from both community and clinical background and a lot of media and then the next year we had a lot of community and fewer clinical this year it seems to have swapped that we had a lot of clinical background and fewer from the community. And uh, that's one of the challenges that we face at CORE, that we want to be able to bring this education to everyone, but how do we strike that balance and reach both sectors? So how does the event that just happened and the people that were there, how does it compare to CORE's first event, which I understand was um, maybe two years ago at the National Jewish Hospital? Yes, at National Jewish, it was um, spearheaded by one of the founding board members, and he has been a speaker at most of our events since, Dr. Russell Poehler, uh, who works at National Jewish. And there was, I think, a lot of, a lot of difficulty believing, I think, that there could be a nonprofit 
that was dedicated to providing evidence-based information and not being pro or con, that we really were not there to persuade you one way or the other. So uh, there was a lot of skepticism and some new newspaper articles and letters to the governor that they were worried about what CORE might mean. And over the years, it has developed, um, really gotten its legs. And we have, I think, some buy-in from the community because we aren't presenting one way or the other. People who have research and this vast amount of knowledge, they are all welcome to come and present. It is up to you, the consumer, to decide um, what to believe, uh, which data set is better. That's what we are there for, is just to provide the evidence. And so just to verify, the mission of CORE, it's really to promote education and research and knowledge. So a little bit more explanation from you is why is it important that CORE doesn't take a pro or con position? I think that it's a, a similar argument that could be made for both uh, the, the research and um, the funding. So we don't get involved ourselves in the actual research. CORE doesn't do any research. So I just wanna be clear about that. Uh, we don't fund any research, but we are a stage where people who are doing research, maybe state funded, um, federal funded, uh, community funded, can come and present their, their information. Um, again, we don't make a judgment about what is, what is good or what is bad. Um, we let you kind of decide that. And in the future, we hope to help uh, maybe train consumers about research and what all of those different levels of research means. Uh, but with the funding, as I, I was alluding to, we also are very careful about where we take funding from. So we don't look like we have a conflict of interest or actually have a conflict of interest. So again, we don't take part in any of the research. We don't recruit patients. We are simply there to provide that form. Before we talk about the origins and you getting involved, have you ever had a conversation with a family member or friend that kind of had a hard time processing what you're doing or even made fun of you because they didn't take it seriously? Like, tell us about one of those conversations that stands out uh, in your head. So I have been widely known in my other roles in life <laughs> as the pot lady. So people will come to me consistently, friends, family, friends of friends, friends of family, and ask for advice. Uh, where should I get uh, the best cannabis? Can I take this for my diabetes? Um, and so they expect that I will have a lot more answers than I actually have. Um, so I've, I've had less of a, of a difficult time uh, with people making fun of it and more of, a, of an interest in what I'm doing and thinking that I probably have more knowledge than I do. Um, so it's a little bit different than you might, than you might have thought. Uh, there was a long time when there's many people in my family who uh, were probably around during the Vietnam era. So there's, you know, a lot of hippies that are out doing pot. And so I get, I get some of that, a little bit of backlash, but um, most of it is Give me advice. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. This um, commodity, this process, this research focus always conjures up some uh, funny conversations and we can only spend so much time trying to uh, you know, educate people. So now let's go to the beginning of CORE. So tell us about some of the early moments and who were the key players and like at what point did you see you had something that was tangible that can contribute to cannabis knowledge and education? I uh, mentioned that a uh, policy maker that I had, I called the colleague of mine, uh, Jordan Wellington, who at the time was, was with the MED, the Marijuana Enforcement Division, and together we wrote um, some recommendations for the child resistant packaging. And it was conversations that we had. He would come to me and say, do you know anybody who's doing XYZ research? And I had researchers coming to me and asking, do you know anybody in the community who? And it, 
it became clear that this was this there was this space this gap so i started doing a little bit of research a little bit more talking and i i sent out just a broad notice and said hey who wants to be part of a group that we're going to get together and we're going to we're going to talk about pot and uh, let's see what comes of it so we sent out a notice and we had a great group of people come together define a mission and thus this entity was born so we had dr bowler we had dr Borg gelt uh, jordan wellington it was a wonderful group of people and i think we all felt that we can do this we can address this need so all the turmoil there's been ups and downs of course and people within research who have had a hard time buying into it um, but I would say probably within the last year, I really felt like we were filling a role and people were starting to trust that we were gonna bring them information, the unbiased information as much as we can, unbiased. So um, Jody, now might be a good time to maybe uh, inform viewers if they wanna learn about CORE, how can they um, uh, learn about it? Like, is there a website and then how can they get a hold of you? So the best way, I try to have my information on our website, it's www.core-networking.org. All my information is generally posted, but um, I love receiving emails from any community researchers. I, I love to try to connect people. If you're looking for somebody who is doing dermatology research, I might know somebody, so I love to connect people. My email address is jody.duke at core-networking.org. So I think my, right now, Jody, let's take a break and when we come back, uh, I'd love to talk to you about maybe a personal health connection you have to the issue of cannabis. All right, welcome back to Getting High on Anthropology. I'm Marty Otanya, the host. Uh, you just watched a video that was produced by a student in the course Cannabis Culture at the University of Colorado, Denver in May of 2017. Uh, so we have a guest tonight, Jody Duke, the executive director of CORE, a nonprofit based in um, Denver. So Jody, many of us who do cannabis research and education have a personal connection to cannabis. For example, in my case, I have chronic kidney disease stage three. So I'm really interested to understand over the long term how to do research on how cannabis potentially could be a therapeutic device to help resolve some of the symptoms or in some small way address the, the disease. I have. So in your situation, is there anything you want to share with us about uh, your background and how um, you have this personal connection to cannabis? Um, absolutely. I'm happy to share. So I have uh, several different personal roles in my life. I have three little girls. One is going to be a teenager very soon. And there are questions that are starting to arise about what is it that you do and and what is cannabis and I just heard one of our friends got busted with marijuana at school what does that mean so I have questions as a mother and my my uh, personal history when I was a lot younger it was about 1996 I was around 19 I was diagnosed with um, stage 3 melanoma that had started to spread through my lymph system and I was so so sick from the treatments that I was getting and my mom was actually the first person to come to me she was so she's little so like five foot three and cute and Catholic and she said honey do you want me to get you some pot <laughs> and that was the first time I had ever really thought about it and that's where I really started to wonder, well, well, no, I don't want you to get me pot mother, but I am curious about how that might help. Since then, I've um, found that I am severely sensitive to narcotics. So re regardless of whether I've had uh, a C-section or a melanoma surgery, I can't take the narcotics. Um, I usually do just fine with Tylenol. I wonder, is there a role in pain for cannabis? So I definitely have some personal connections and backgrounds and uh, a wondering mind. 
some people, when they listen to you and learn about CORE, may be inspired to get involved or maybe even start their own nonprofit. What lessons have you learned, you know, being one of the forces along with other people about the process of creating a cannabis nonprofit organization? Well, I have learned a lot along the way. And I think one of the biggest ones is I needed a thicker skin. <laughs> um, I am not good at being in the spotlight. I, I don't ever feel like I know enough to share with other people that I just don't have that kind of knowledge. So I'd love to surround myself with brilliant people. Uh, but the thicker skin in the cannabis world, I think, is the most important to not take offense when people say, oh, you know, cannabis, it's just destroying the world or it's gonna save us all. So you have to be able to listen to that and to, to let it roll off your back and not to take offense, just keep going the path that you think is right. And one foot in front of the other and be ready for newspaper articles and people calling you pot lady or or whatever and it's it's gonna be okay you'll be better for it but it it makes you think is this where i really want to be yeah i've been working with you for again over a year in core and i've learned a lot from you watching you as a leader so i appreciate the work you do so tell us about the future so core is going to have events in the future so tell us about one of the upcoming events and why do you think people should get involved with uh, core so we are located in Aurora, Colorado, but we've started expanding our reach. We had a previous um, core meeting in San Francisco, and we will be having another one in San Francisco, um, April 29th, I believe is the right date. And we have a save the date out. Um, I think that if we can get people to come to the table, we have all got the same interests at heart, that we want what is best for the consumer, for the patient. We want people to be healthy and happy in their lives. If, if we come to the table with that and open our minds, we learn so much from each other. The cannabis community has so much to offer, so much knowledge it is they amaze me every day and researchers have so much information and imagine what we could do with those two pieces coming together so i would love to have more people at the conferences who are willing to come to the table and just listen well what i appreciate about core is how so few people can pull off such you know really incredibly important events <laughs> So in terms of individuals, if they're interested, for example, to be a board member, what do you think are the skills or traits for someone if they want to get involved at that higher level? What makes a good board member? Well, I think that you have to really buy into the mission, that you really have to believe in what we're doing and be able to wear a very neutral hat. Uh, we all do different things in our lives. Uh, but when we come to the table, we come to the table as a unit and we want this education to get out there. So that's the first and foremost. You have to have somebody passionate about your mission and active, wanting to get involved. And there's a variety of ways to do that. There's people who behind the scenes need to help with the accounting and make sure that everything is taken care of and accountable. And then there are people who are more active and more of the face of your organization. And I think understanding what each role is and what you might be missing, what are your strengths and weaknesses, uh, that's a good board member is going to fill those roles. So I think that that's what you, that's the first and foremost, you need to have somebody active and have somebody who really believes in your mission. One more time, we're with Jody Duke. She's the executive director of CORE, a nonprofit based in Denver, Colorado that promotes uh, cannabis education and research. So Jody, just to clarify, to educate others about CORE, when people go to CORE events, is there a consumption of cannabis? Are people walking around with dabs and getting high? Like explain to me about a CORE event and what people experience. Well, it's different from event to event. We try to go to different places and we're still 
walking that line, figuring out how to best reach the different sectors of community. But to date, we have traditionally been in the uh, academic sort of um, background. So we might be at a university and uh, one was at uh, a historical church out on the Auraria campus. Thank you to our board member, Marty uh, Otanias, who we couldn't do a lot of this without you. Um, this one was at this last one in November 11th was at the Anschutz Medical Campus in two of the classrooms that they had there. So you might come um, hear a little bit about the different sectors of research that are happening and whether it's public health, um, anthropology, uh, metabolism, uh, breastfeeding. So you would get a, a breadth of information uh, you get to, you know, have coffee and, and a light breakfast and, and a light lunch and just really get to know people. There are so many people with similar interests who don't have other chances to meet and they get to come together and talk. So that has been uh, wonderful. So there's not consumption. Um, there hasn't been uh, any consumption. We don't for a lot of reasons, we're working through uh, finances like any other nonprofit. So accepting money from uh, uh, shops would perhaps look like uh, a conflict of interest or perhaps it would be a conflict of interest. So we actually haven't accepted any funding from any shops to date. Um, but I think that helps give us uh, the neutral feeling. So we do try to be cognizant of that. There's not uh, booths with things for sale. You don't see different products. Um, you really are just there getting um, grounded in the, the research that's happening. Now, are you hopeful about the future of cannabis research and education? And if so, what gives you that hope? You know, I think so, it, especially if after this last conference that we had, it was fascinating to hear all of the different sectors that have really opened up and started doing their own research. Um, we heard researchers who were learning so much from the community members that they had no idea about. We had people like Dr. Maureen Leahy who uh, presented about uh, the use of cannabis in her Parkinson's patients and how helpful that has seem to have been for at this moment. So I think as she moves forward, as Dr. Della Valle, who does um, dermatology research, as this continues to move forward, I think that we will see um, a myriad of things come out of this. And I, I certainly hope that uh, I can be a part of it. Excellent, Jody. I think we're gonna end here. Just to remind people, this is Getting High on Anthropology. and that's probably what fueled me to learn about it more. I started uh, realizing there were differences in things that were out there like uh, catnip with my cat. Wondered why such a plant could make a cat go crazy and then I started realizing my dad smoked cigarettes so there was something similar to that so that's probably how I started smoking. I tried that. Those were horrible. Uh, I had very bad experiences with that. Tried smoking the catnip. Nothing from that. And then uh, did the same thing with uh, the same type of leaf product that I found over at a buddy's house and uh, was just kind of laying around. So I decided to use that in the way that I was seeing somebody else smoke it. And instead of a cigarette, put it in a pipe type thing. And yeah, that was a much different experience and I could understand a little bit more about how differences of plants and everything were. So uh, yeah, my whole eye is everything had just opened up from that point. Well, there's way too much to explain. Uh, I started writing the book, uh, the books that I wrote about all the information that I learned. Uh, I tried to retain everything that I that I was picking up from uh, when my friends started learning how to grow it. Uh, it was fascinating when I was learning about it, learning about how many different uh, ailments it could help. Three components that I'm referring to would be the anti-angiogenic properties, the anti-metastatic properties, and the apoptosis or apoptotic property that comes from the plant also, or from foods. But those three uh, compounds are what's 
so special about uh, your body because that does affect the stem cell, the cancer stem cell. It doesn't cure, that's one thing that you need to know. It doesn't cure anything, it just, it works symbiotically with the body. What you eat, how you exercise, how you live, it has to do with all of those little elements and it helps you function better. That's basically the gist of what I've learned about that point. Well, I think the first time that I, it wasn't a cancer, it was a, the scare of death, but uh, this last most recent time, uh, yeah, I definitely thought I was going to die pretty soon. Uh, colon cancer is what I'm talking about. I don't think there was very many pictures of me taken, but if there were, my face was more pale than it is now, and yeah, I was definitely in pretty bad shape. My body wasn't looking the way it normally used to, losing hair, uh, my fingernails and toenails were striated, experiencing things that I definitely was afraid of, and I had no idea what, what to expect. I guess at that point, that's when I really started to delve into nutrition. And since you can't get a hold of the CBD in liquid form or in oil form very easily here, I had to do it the old ghetto way, and that's what I call the ghetto way. This is what I learned a long, long time ago. Basically, you have to extract the components or the, the qualities of the plant. And there are many ways to do it, and the way I did it was uh, through a pipe and gathering all the resin that I would get from smoking, you know, basically putting it in my food, trying to cook with it, learning how to cook with it. very strong content of cannabidiol. Uh, there are different types of components that you can get from that plant, like uh, CBG, CBD, uh, CBN, THC, uh, you know, there's such a huge list of so many different types of compounds. Well, I've always liked art. I've always liked uh, drawing, painting. It's always been a therapeutic thing. So I incorporated art with everything I learned, and I found that that made it fun for me. Everything I do is artistic. Uh, everything I learn about, I try to draw or put down on paper somehow so that I can remember. The fact that it's starting to happen here in Colorado and Denver, legalizing cannabis is, it's not a bad thing. I would say it's also not as good as I thought it was when I first started putting my name on a, on a list to get it legalized. I was one of the first activists uh, to put my name on that list uh, at the Capitol and we were doing all of the uh, gatherings in, the, in front of the Capitol to try to inform and educate more people about it. What I didn't realize back then was it was still on a federal level of a section three, section two. Still, um, the point that I'm trying to make is it's on a schedule that it doesn't belong on. They view it as deadly a drug as some of the other drugs that are out there that are deadly. It's not a drug in my eyes. Perspectively speaking, it is a plant. Uh, drugs to me are like pills. The, prescriptions that you would get from a doctor. As far as the plant is concerned, all the research I've done, all the studies I've looked at, all the things I've read, documentaries I've heard of, watched, not a one of them has ever listed, documented, proof of any harm to the body, period. And uh, for them to label it as a drug is bad, because it's not a drug if it's left alone organically. I feel that it should be pretty much the same as a, a tomato plant. It should be grown in our backyards. It should be allowed to be sold in the supermarkets. Uh, it should be allowed to be put inside of jars, uh, mason jars, inside of soups. Something that should be allowed without even having any negative connotations about what it can do. That's just something that's happening because of the industry uh, taking over. And these people who are affected by it, they should definitely be compensated for what they're losing. If they're losing areas to live or something like that, this needs to, needs to be dealt with, needs to change. Mm -hmm.